So I decided to recreate Shazam's song recognition algorithm out of curiosity. Okay, fine. It was mostly out of sheer desperation. Because let's be real. Landing a junior dev job these days feels harder than breaking into a bank. If you're a developer with less than three years of experience, you get what I mean. And if you don't, well, I genuinely envy you. But Shazam has always blown my mind. You hold up your phone, it listens for a few seconds, and then, boom, it tells you exactly what song is playing in the background. Magic, right? Well, tech magic. And I thought, if I can reverse engineer this sorcery, maybe hiring managers will finally see that I'm serious about my engineering career. But how do you even start building something like this? I mean, I was as clueless as anyone at the beginning. So I did what any good engineer would do. I researched, or rather, I googled. I went down a rabbit hole, reading every article, blog post, and research paper I could find about Shazam's technology. And here's the simplified version of what I learned. The magic of Shazam lies in something called audio fingerprinting. It's like creating a unique DNA profile for every song. This fingerprint lets Shazam recognize a song based on a small snippet of audio. First, the song is converted into something called a spectrogram which captures the frequency content of the audio over time, showing which frequencies are present at each moment and how intense they are. From the spectrogram, Shazam pinpoints frequencies with high intensity, the ones representing the notes or beats that stand out in the song. These frequencies, known as peaks, are like the song's unique features that make it recognizable. Shazam encodes the relationship between these peaks into unique hashes, and links them to the song's metadata, like its title and artist, and the exact time each peak occurred in the spectrogram. Thousands of these hashes come together to form the song's fingerprint. The fingerprint is then stored in a database, where each hash serves as a quick reference point for searches. When you use Shazam, the app records a short audio snippet and runs it through the same fingerprinting process. This time, though, the hashes are not saved to the database. Instead, they are used to query the database for matches. The results are then grouped by song ID, isolating potential candidates. At first glance, it might seem logical to assume the song with the most matches is the correct one, but that's not quite the case. Instead, Shazam analyzes the time coherence of the candidates, evaluating how well the snippet's timestamps align with those of each candidate. The song with the highest time coherence is ultimately identified as the correct match. And voila, that's basically how Shazam works. Pretty straightforward, right? Once I wrapped my head around the theory, it was time to get coding. I used Golang to code the algorithm from scratch with no libraries, because why take the easy route when you can suffer for the sake of learning? But for some of the heavy lifting, like handling audio files, I had to call in reinforcements. If you'd like to check out my implementation, I've added the GitHub link to the project in the description below, along with a link to a demo where you can see the algorithm in action. The first challenge was transforming raw audio into a recognizable fingerprint. To tackle this, I wrote three key functions that the raw audio data has to go through sequentially to generate the fingerprint. The first function takes the raw audio data as input and converts it to a spectrogram. This meant transforming the audio from the time domain into the frequency domain so I could visualize its frequency components over time. To achieve this, I split the audio into overlapping segments using the sliding window technique so I could analyze and process smaller parts without missing any key features. But this slicing introduced artificial jumps at the edges of each segment, which is a problem also known as spectral leakage. It's like trying to cut bread with a dull knife. It gets messy at the edges. To smooth out these jumps, I apply the Hamming window function, which tapers off the signal at the edges, creating a smooth transition and reducing distortions. Finally, I apply the Fast Fourier Transform, FFT, to each segment. The FFT is the essential tool that transforms the audio from its time domain into the frequency domain, unlocking its frequency components. This process produces the spectrogram, a two-dimensional matrix of complex numbers where rows represent frequencies, columns represent time intervals, and the values indicate intensity. But here's the thing, spectrograms can be massive, especially for long audio samples. To keep things efficient, 
Right before I split the audio and run the FFT, I downsampled the audio and limited the frequency range to the part where most musical information lies, around 20 Hz to 5 kHz. This reduced processing overhead and improved the signal to noise ratio, making it easier to extract meaningful features later. The next step was to extract the standout frequencies, or peaks, that make the audio uniquely identifiable from the spectrogram. This is where the second function in the process comes into play. To extract these peaks effectively, I applied a filter of six logarithmic frequency bands. These bands are designed to mimic the human ear's sensitivity to sound. Human ears struggle to perceive low frequencies less than 500 Hz, but are naturally more attuned to mid to high frequencies 500 to 2000 Hz. As a result, low frequencies are often amplified in music during production. So, for each segment of the spectrogram, I identified the loudest frequencies within each band. This approach ensures a balanced representation across the spectrum and prevents low frequency content from dominating. Next, I calculated the average magnitude of these six strongest frequencies and used it as a dynamic threshold. Frequencies below this threshold were discarded, ensuring that weak frequencies from any band were not retained simply because they were the strongest within their band. Doing this not only preserves essential peaks, but also reduces data size, optimizing the process for efficient matching down the line. With the peaks extracted from the spectrogram, we now have a collection of data points highlighting the audio's most distinctive features. But these peaks on their own aren't enough for song identification. To transform them into something meaningful and searchable, we need to encode the relationships between them in a compact, queryable format. This brings us to the third function, the fingerprinting process. Here, each peak, called the anchor, is treated as a reference point. For every anchor, I identify five nearby peaks, or targets, within a fixed range, forming what's known as the target zone. This relationship forms the basis of the fingerprint. For each anchor target pair, I create a unique hash by encoding the frequencies of the anchor and target peaks, along with their time difference, into a compact 32-bit integer. This hash is small enough to store efficiently, but still packs all the information needed to uniquely identify the audio. This data is temporarily stored in a hash map where the hash serves as the key, and the value is an array containing the anchor's timestamp and the song ID. Since different songs may share similar features, the same hash can be generated for multiple songs. When this happens, their details are appended to the array under that hash. Thousands of these hashes are generated to form a complete fingerprint, which is then saved to the database. Once the fingerprinting process was up and running, the next step was to upload songs and find matches. That's when I shifted gears and started building the front end. Now, I could have used plain old vanilla JS, but after wrestling with the fingerprinting process for so long, I decided I deserved a break, so I went with React instead. For communication between the front end and the server, I used WebSocket. Since the main goal of this project was to implement and explore the algorithm, rather than build a commercial app, I kept things simple. Instead of auto-scanning the world for songs, I had users upload the songs they wanted to match. To make this process seamless, I integrated Spotify, allowing users to paste a link to a song, album, or playlist. Since Spotify doesn't allow direct downloads, I use their API to fetch relevant data about the song, such as the title, artist, and album name. I then search for the song on YouTube using this data. If a match is found, I proceed to download the audio from the YouTube video. Afterward, I assign a unique ID to the song, and all relevant data about the song, including the YouTube video ID, are saved to a song database. Next, the song's audio data goes through the fingerprinting process, and the resulting fingerprints are stored in the fingerprint database. Once the song uploading process was working OK, I was ready to work on the real challenge, matching songs from short audio snippets. This is where the magic happens. The process kicks off when a user records a short audio clip, either from their microphone or directly from their computer. The snippet is encoded in base64 format and sent to the server for processing. On the server side, the raw audio is decoded and processed to generate its fingerprint. 
the hashes in the fingerprint are extracted and used to query the fingerprint database for matches. Then I organize the retrieved results, mapping each song ID to its associated anchor times. To find the best match, I evaluate how well the audio snippet align with the candidate songs. For each candidate, I calculate the absolute time difference between successive anchor pairs in both the snippet and the candidate. Next, I calculate the absolute difference between these two values. If this difference falls within a tolerance of 100 milliseconds, the pair is marked as consistent and the candidate's time coherence score is incremented by one. After calculating the scores, I fetch metadata for the top scoring candidates from the song's database. For each match, I then create an object containing the song's metadata, the earliest anchor time, and the coherence score. Finally, I sort the matches in descending order by their scores and send them to the front end. There, I use YouTube's iframe to display the corresponding video for each match starting at the exact timestamp where the match was found. This has definitely been the most challenging project I've worked on so far. Whether it helps me land a job or not, I'm glad I took on the challenge. Unfortunately, I can't do a proper demo here because copyright laws exist, but I've put together a demo video that showcases everything in action. You can find the link in the description along with the GitHub repo if you'd like to check out the code.